The 1916 Rising in Dublin was defeated by British forces and after the executions of the rebel leaders, there was peace for quite a while. But tensions increased in 1917 after some of the prisoners had been released and the conscription crisis arose where the British intended to introduce conscription in Ireland. Previously, all the Irish soldiers who'd gone to the First World War were volunteers. And rebel activity broke out again. Some say the War of Independence started in Cork when there was an attack on a policeman in Skull and a police barracks. The Kerry men say that the attack on Gortat Lee police station in which two volunteers were killed was the first incident of the War of Independence. And there was a further breakout of the War of Independence in January 1919 when a dynamite convoy was attacked by rebels in Tipperary at Salahad Byug and uh, two policemen were killed. These incidents were relatively sporadic and there were few and far between. But in Dublin, the IRA intelligence agents operated and run by Michael Collins and known as the squad, commenced shooting policemen who had maltreated volunteers in 1916 and were eyes and ears of the British forces in Ireland at the time. These were known as the G branch of Dublin Metropolitan Police. As 1919 progressed into 1920, shootings of policemen all over the country became more common. The British were at pains as to what to do about this increased level of disorder. They were hampered by reductions in the number of RIC as men retired or were intimidated or felt that they should resign because of the nationalist fervour that was sweeping the country. In order to counter this activity, the police replacements known as the Black and Tans were introduced into the RIC in March 1920. In summer 1920, the auxiliaries were recruited. These were ex-officers and they were an independent police force attached to the RIC and based in mobile companies in about 12 or 14 locations around the country, but mostly in Dublin. However, in the background, a further force was recruited and these were secret service men introduced into Dublin. The initial recruits for this were under the control of Scotland Yard and were colonial policemen, a small number of whom were brought in in the first half of 1920. But they were dispensed with and sent back to Hong Kong and China and India by September 1920. But in the background of all of this were the Secret Service, of whom 90 were recruited and their grades and definitions and ranks were all uh, laid out in a document in financial records because the Secret Service records themselves were destroyed in the 1930s. Mostly ex-army officers were recruited for this uh, work and they were based in Dublin Castle, some were based in Galway, some were based in Victoria Barracks in Cork. These have had legendary status and their purpose was to assassinate prominent Sinn Féin politicians and IRA leaders. They had an air of mystery about them because they were instructed to take up occupations and conceal themselves within the community. Some were described as insurance agents, singer sewing machine, travellers, and they were to live in small hotels, guest houses and digs in the community so that they would be largely invisible. The most mysterious aspect of their work was that these men are universally known today as the Cairo Gang. While the name is universal and widely used by journalists under all circumstances, the first mention of this word Cairo Gang is by Rex Taylor in his book on Michael Collins, published in 1958. He says, in Cairo, 16 officers were chosen for a special task. 
He doesn't suggest a list for the names of the 16. They were police rather than army officers. And their appointment would have not appeared in the London Gazette like army men. The best estimate is that the possible 16 were the MI6 director and former of Indian Special Branch director Charles Teagart's group, predating June 1920, so that any agent appointed before May 1920 is a possible candidate. Taylor says the Cairo group travelled under assumed names and arrived in Dublin singly on different dates. They were in plain clothes and posing as commercial travellers. They rented flats in Pembroke Street and Mount Street. They were not to go near the castle, but to report to Colonel Ormond Winter daily at either the Cairo Cafe or Kids Restaurant. The Cairo Cafe was in Grafton Street, and Kids Restaurant later became the Porterhouse Bar in Nassau Street. They called themselves the Cairo Group. The squad called them the Cairo Gang. Now, this phrase is not beyond dispute, because nobody in the Michael Collins squad, and that many of them gave interviews to the Bureau of Military History, used the word Cairo gang at all. And an electronic search of the newspapers shows that the very first mentions in the Irish press date from 1959 and 1960. Books written shortly after the events of the War of Independence talk of secret service and sometimes murder gang, also particular ones. British military seem to refer to hush-hush men. Uh, Richard Bennett in 1959 talks of British intelligence officers and hush-hush men, but makes no mention of Cairo gang. James Gleeson, uh, in his book on Michael Collins, again makes no mention of the word Cairo gang. Dan Breen's My Fight for Irish Freedom ran to four editions. And the first three editions being the 1920s and 1930s and into the 1950s, makes no mention of the Cairo gang. But the 1963 edition has the phrase added with the suggestion that they were recruited in Egypt. And this edition is significant in that it follows the Rex Taylor description of the Cairo gang, but has no provenance in the previous editions. The Secret Service men immediately began to take effect in the struggle against the IRA. They were involved in shootings uh, of prominent Sinn Féin men in various parts of the country. Their work is not always clear because there were RIC assassination groups working at the same time. One of their victims was the uncle of Brendan Carroll, the comedian, of Mrs. Brown's boys. Uh, his two sons were active IRA men and a raiding party went to their house in Capel Street in Dublin and on finding that the two boys were not present, they shot their father. This was the work of secret service men. These were used to beef up raiding parties. And in another picture in January 1921 of a raid on a public house in Capel Street, where there's a tank pictured breaking down the front door. The photograph uh, taken by a Dutch photographer shows two mysterious civilians lurking in doorways. These were, in my mind, without doubt, Secret Service agents to identify anybody who might be captured and maybe even to kill them. So dangerous had the group become by November 1920 that... Uh, the higher echelons of the IRA, especially Michael Collins, had decided that they needed to be eliminated. There was intelligence information from Lily Mernon, who worked as a typist in British military headquarters, and the addresses of a number of Secret Service agents were ascertained and their movements checked. And on Sunday morning, Bloody Sunday, the 20th of November 1920, in a simultaneous attack on as many addresses as possible, 14 of these agents were shot dead, mostly in their beds. They were armed, sometimes their families were with them or their wives were with them, and it was a brutal episode. But they were considered so dangerous that there was no alternative but to attack them. Frank Thornton in a statement said, 
they wiped out the Secret Service on Bloody Sunday. But that's not true, because as I've mentioned, the establishment list had some 80 names on it. And most of these names are known nowadays. Uh, So they had been struck a severe blow, and many of the others, thinking that they had been uncovered, retreated into the castle, and their activities were greatly curtailed. The British response to the assassination of their Secret Service men was swift and brutal. In the afternoon, a football match was to be played between a Tipperary team and a Dublin team in Croke Park. And it was suspected by the British authorities that Tipperary men had come up for the assassinations and that they would attend this game. The football ground was surrounded by a cordon of military at a distance with armoured cars and a group of police assembled. Policemen from the depot and reserve companies of the RIC, which didn't normally operate in Dublin, set out from the Phoenix Park depot via Beggar's Bush Barracks, where they picked up a force of auxiliaries, and they drove to Croke Park. It's very significant that RIC men were involved, because policing in Dublin was normally conducted by the Dublin Metropolitan Police, some of whom were on duty at Croke Park for normal crowd control. The purpose of the police from the depot and reserve companies was to identify countrymen. These were a special selected force and were known as the Igo Gang. There is huge confusion between the various uh, operational units of the British authorities at the time and their work was not necessarily coordinated very well but these RIC men charged into Croke Park shooting wildly and killed 14 people in the crowd three of whom were youngsters sitting in trees near the wall at the canal end. Contrary to the film Michael Collins the armoured car did not go onto the pitch nor did the armoured car fire at the crowd though did One did fire warning shots at people who were getting over a wall at one end. But the general thing was that this Igo gang were the people who did the shooting. These were old RIC men, not black and tans recently recruited, because only the old RIC men could identify the people that they thought they wanted. In addition, though there were auxiliaries present, The evidence of the inquiry is that the auxiliaries didn't do the shooting and Dublin Metropolitan Police, who were also witnesses to the incident, were fairly clear that it was the police that did the shooting. This is relevant in that the Igo gang is often confused with the uh, alleged Cairo gang. And unlike the Cairo gang, Many, many accounts of volunteers in the Bureau of Military History witness statements mentioned this Igo gang and their activities around the country. They were led by a constable, Eugene Igo, who uh, operated in later times from the depot in Dublin and patrolled Dublin looking for uh, country volunteers who had come to the city in hiding. This brings us to the photograph of the uh, alleged victims of Bloody Sunday, which is widely used in newspapers and uh, always used by journalists as the agents that were killed on Bloody Sunday. But this photograph is in the Pierce Beasley papers in the National Library of Ireland, and it's now kept in the National Photographic Archive. And it clearly says on the back of the photograph, Special Gang F Company of the Auxiliaries, who would have been based in Dublin Castle. A photograph exists uh, of a group of men in an alleyway beside Dublin Castle. The alleyway is still there and the buildings look much the same. The photograph comes from the Pierce Beasley papers and it's labelled on the back Special Gang F Company Auxiliaries. It's now held in the National Photographic Archive in Temple Bar. There are multiple copies of the photograph in the file and more were circulated to IRA intelligence trackers. 
Pierce Beasley was the intelligence officer in Dublin, attached to General Headquarters and a 1916 veteran. He was uncle of the Lily Mernon who had identified the Secret Service agents to be attacked on Bloody Sunday. An identical photograph is supplied to journalists by Getty Images. And the Getty Images photograph has been published numerous times, described as Cairo Gang. But the story is that Sean Sexton, who collected Irish photographs, found it in a dustbin in London. It's identical to the eight copies from the Beasley Papers. Getty Images and the National Museum exhibition entitled the photo incorrectly as Igo Gang subsequently. But it can't be Igo Gang because the Igo gang were all RIC men, and these men are clearly identified and named as auxiliaries. The names are in the Frank Thornton album of intelligence photographs, and Igo gang members were RIC men, not English men, who could identify volunteers from various parts of the country. The location of the photograph is only 100 yards from the guard room in Exchange Street beside the City Hall where the auxiliaries murdered Clancy, Clune and McKee on Bloody Sunday. These were uh, volunteers who were picked up in Dublin ahead of the shootings and they had the misfortune to be in prison at the time that the shootings occurred. The names of the auxiliaries are described in the Frank Thornton file and they correspond with members of the auxiliary group. One member is missing from the photograph, but there is a, there is a man uh, sitting on a windowsill and only his legs are visible. He didn't pose for the photograph. Uh, it's believed that this man's name was Crewe. Contrary to the normal caption on this photograph, these were not the men shot on Bloody Sunday. Indeed, they all survived except one, squadron leader Leonard Appleford, who was a, a, an auxiliary, he was killed in a shooting in June 1921 in Baggett Street. So really the conclusion of all of this is that a photograph that has been used for 40 years now in fact has no provenance other than that it was a convenient photograph uh, supposed to show the people who were killed on Bloody Sunday. But it's only one of the mysteries of this era that has been introduced and it's a mystery of history why such a misattribution should have been reiterated so many times and shows how a legend that has no basis in fact can be become apparent fact just by repetition. This is an early example of fake news where in the absence of full information and in an era of secrecy and subterfuge a legend can be born and then some information produced in this case a photograph to reinforce the legend both of which are equally false indeed this is the epitome of not letting the facts get in the way of a good story and worse than that adding an element of verisimilitude to an otherwise bold and unconvincing narrative.